So I'm Suzanne Egrin. I work on the detection and characterization of extrasolar planets, which are planets around other stars than the Sun. And I have, over the years, been particularly interested in looking for the kind of small temperate planets that might be susceptible to hosting life. My name is Michael Meyer. I study star and planet formation, and increasingly uh, the attempts to take direct images of planets around nearby stars. Another topic which we should discuss is the concept of habitable zone. Um, so that concept was um, formalized, I guess, in the early 90s by Jim Casting and others. Um, and it's, as they conceived it, it's based on the notion that in order for um, life to have the potential to arise on an exoplanet or any kind of planet, it needs to have significant amounts of liquid water on its surface. Um, and as I discussed yesterday, um, there are two main difficulties with this notion. One of them is that we don't know for sure that liquid water is necessary. Um, we know it was important in our own evolutionary history, but we don't know that um, other forms of liquid solvents might not do the trick just as well. Uh, it's also quite possible that life might arise below the surface or in the atmosphere of a planet. Um, and the other problem is that it's actually very hard to determine um, from the bulk properties of an exoplanet, which we can measure remotely, whether or not it's likely to have a liquid ocean. We can estimate something which is called its equilibrium temperature, which is the temperature it would have on its surface if it re-radiated to space exactly the same amount of radiation that it receives from its host star. And that gives us a ballpark estimate. But if you do that exercise from the Earth, for example, you'd find it's far too cold to have a liquid water ocean. The reason it's warmer is because of the greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere and the um, quantity and potency of these greenhouse gases in our own atmosphere has varied tremendously over the years. And in a sense, it's a kind of feedback system that's enabled the surface temperature of the Earth to remain more or less constant as the sun's uh, brightness has increased over the last few billion years. That could be uh, considered an example of fine tuning. Um, I think I like to think of it more as an example of a complex system adapting to its environment. Um, but the point is that um, scientists who study the climate of paleo Earth and Earth-like planets in general will tell you that the conditions that have to be in place for a planet to retain a liquid ocean of any kind are actually quite subtle. Um, and if you try and simulate an exoplanet, start it off with a liquid ocean, whether you make it from water or CO2 or methane, and let it evolve, under many circumstances, that ocean will evaporate and disappear. Um, so that means that when we're looking for exoplanets and we're trying to evaluate how frequent planets like the Earth are, uh, planets that might sus be susceptible to life, or we're trying to design a future experiment to go and say, look for signs of life on an exoplanet, we have to avoid uh, being too narrow in our definition of the habitable zone, otherwise we might just t essentially force ourselves to find only what we expect to find. Um, we also have to bear in mind that of all the planets that lie in this potential, potential zone that we define, however broad we define it, it may be that only a very small fraction actually are habitable. Um, and so that's basically the, the thrust of what I was trying to say yesterday. Yeah, and uh, the, the concept you brought up, this work that uh, several researchers have pursued in the last year, that a, a, hydrogen a molecular hydrogen rich uh, envelope around a planet can be a very effective greenhouse gas, allowing them to be much warmer than you thought at much larger orbital separations. That's right. So our, as you said, our concept of the habitable zone is greatly expanded. What I find troubling is the notion, and I'm not picking uh, uh, at the scientists of 20 years ago, but even in the moment, any scientist who thinks that we understand enough to fully characterize under what conditions there could be liquid water, even anywhere in our solar system, I find that a bit um, uh, too to beyond the pale, to really think we understand. In our, in our own solar system, the idea that orbital uh, tidal effects between moons and planets can give rise to energy, which would give cooler bodies much more heat than you might naively expect. And, you know, uh, uh, on Europa, for example, we have a strong idea that there's a, a uh, rather thick liquid ocean underneath the ice cap there, and that the tidal effects cause these crackings, which also lead to uh, circulation of the water, perhaps from 
the surface from time to time to deep in the system. There, there are many ways in which moons could be habitable around other planets, regardless of where their location is in the system. So I, I, I'm just amazed, excuse me, I'm just amazed that people think we understand enough about uh, the conditions under which life could form and the places where there could be liquid water in a planetary system to design an experiment to look for what we think we must find. I find that a bit uh, uh, not a good approach myself. Well, it's a, it's a question we had to grapple in the context of this um, um, study that I was part of in the last couple of years, where we were asked to consider what the scientific goals and requirements might be for the next generation of large space telescopes beyond the James Webb Space Telescope, which will fly in a couple of years. So this is something that might be flown in maybe uh, 20, 25 years that would be considerably larger, enable a wide range of astrophysics. But it was, it, it was clear from the start that one of the key drivers might be the search for life on exoplanets or signs of life on exoplanets. And um, we had to decide, you know, whether we would use any kind of Earth centric concept of where life might be and what an exoplanet might be. And we were, um, so the, the main exoplanet people on this committee were Sarah Seeger, Olivier Guillon, who's a coronagraph expert, and myself. And it's a difficult thing to decide. Um, we were exceedingly conscious of the limitations of the concept of habitable zone, biosignatures, etc. But at the same time, you have to start somewhere if you're going to try and um, come up with a set of technical requirements for a telescope like this. Because if you don't allow yourself to um, say, for example, I want to be able to detect a planet like the Earth, then you could say, well, you could have any size of telescope and then you will detect what you detect. But you just said it, it's like the Earth. What does that mean? <laughs> the Earth has many, many properties, right? Uh, and, and so which ones do we decide we need to detect? Uh, the idea of designing some requirement that would enable you to see something like X, where X is something we think we understand and can write it down, that's okay with me, but I would call that exploration and not science in the sense that if you don't find what you're looking for, you can't rule out a wide set of other things that might be just as interesting as the thing you thought you were looking for. So the requirements that you describe could well be applied to uh, determining the frequency of rocky planets of a certain size at certain orbital distances from their star. And that already is a scientific experiment because if I don't see them, when I really know from very basic physical principles I should have seen something, um, you can already rule out or place constraints on the population of those kinds of bodies. And that for me is more scientific hypothesis testing as opposed to exploration where I just create the conditions under which I might see something if it's there to be found. But if I don't see it, I really have a hard time putting upper limits on its frequency. So you're completely right, of course. Um, and one of the reasons I think that people focus on um, an Earth-centric concept of what kinds of planets might be susceptible to host life is that um, they are considerably, considerably harder to detect and to study than similar planets might be further out away from their stars. And so if you design an experiment that is capable of finding planets in what we consider the habitable zone, then um, you will automatically, if you're working with direct imaging, also be able to find planets further out in the system. Um, and similarly, if you design your experiment to be able to study enough systems that you will um, have a reasonable hope of putting some interesting constraints on the fraction of them that show interesting combinations of molecules in their spectra, um, then if you base that fraction, the, if you base the fraction of planets in the, in the range that you want to study on a relatively narrow concept of the habitable zone, then you're playing it safe. Because if the real range of planets that might have um, might be interesting abodes for life is actually much wider, you'll just have more systems to study. Um, so I guess it's a bit of an insurance policy. Well, that's almost true, I, I, in the sense that there are always unintended consequences of certain design decisions that one has to make in a space telescope. Turns out the field of view of every instrument isn't infinite. So there are always larger orbital radii, which in principle would be easier to detect, but you will miss things. The adaptive optics or the corrective optics will have a limitation of the place where you're tuning 
it for. And there will be places where it's actually, in principle, easier to detect, but in practice harder because of the design compromises one has had to make in space-based instrumentation. So that's one of the um, reasons why the starshade option is also appealing, because that has no outer limit, except the field of view of your detector, but that will be huge. Well, I, so I, you know, I'm very um, sympathetic to this view of, you know, you want to enable something that could possibly detect life on a kind of terrestrial planet if it's there to be found. But it's also uh, dangerous to mislead if people think they can take that then as a real uh, uh, scientific experiment in the sense that if you don't find it, would you place an interesting upper limit on the frequency of life in the Milky Way? And because it's such a compelling and important question, I think the, the public who read that report or see the press release about it might get the feeling that this is really you know, the life tester for the Milky Way. And I think this would be unfortunate. I think you will put an interesting test on the current prevailing concept of what an Earth-like planet that supports life might be like. So you, if you, for example, if you run such an experiment and you find no planets in the range of separations and sizes that have interesting combinations of molecules in their atmosphere, um, you will put an interest, you will put a strong constraint on, you know, the frequency of these planets and the likelihood that they develop some well, kind that of... That they have those molecules. That they have those molecules, exactly. <laughs> that's all you can say. Okay, that's all you can say. But that in itself is very interesting because it will tell us, okay, those particular properties which we thought were important for life, they are not fulfilled commonly. And then you take it from there and you say, okay, well, now I have to either think that life is relatively rare or vastly broaden my concept. Um, but the other thing is, I would say is you will, I mean, an experiment like this will not just test those kinds of planets. It will take, uh, it will discover planets over a much wider range of orbital. Yes, it has an outer limit, but it will still discover planets over a much wider range of orbital distances and it will take spectra of Neptune-like objects, super-Earths, all sorts of objects which we don't necessarily think currently are particularly promising abodes for life. Well, but I was involved in a similar uh, exercise for the what is now the James Webb Space Telescope for 18 years ago, and it was a similar thing in the sense that Everyone wanted to create a design reference mission of exactly what the telescope will do and the achievements that it could make. But to me, in the end, the discovery space that was opened up by the cap capabilities was more powerful than the arguments of, you know, we will measure this frequency of white dwarf this, or we will detect the first stars at redshift of two to seven, and so on and so forth. I found the opening of parameter space uh, a more compelling argument, the discovery space argument. And it was particularly there because we were moving into the infrared um, in space where the competition from the ground is great for fine angular resolution because we will have even larger telescopes uh, in the future than we uh, have now and certainly uh, larger uh, apertures than the James Webb Space Telescope. But the sensitivity to the thermal infrared wavelengths beyond two microns is so wonderful and so compelling and so deep compared to what we can do from the ground in uh, 10,000 to a million times the exposure time it would take to reach those sensitivities. That just you know blew open the doors on the discovery space and for me was a very compelling argument. I think the telescope that you and your colleagues studied, a large aperture you know, optical near infrared, uh, a wide aperture, eight to 12 meter scale. This has such discovery space for so many things, including the possibility that it might be able to detect certain biosignatures in certain systems. I think if the resources can be found that wouldn't compromise, you know, one has to imagine how much it will cost. And that's an important consideration course, yeah, yeah. as well. I mean and then balance that against the other ways in which those monies could be invested to assess whether that's the choice you want to make for the next generation. But my own personal opinion is it's a very, very compelling vision for the next 20, 30 years of space-based astrophysics. So, there, I mean, there are two interesting points. One of them is, the first one is, I think everybody on the committee would prefer to be able to make the argument simply in terms of discovery space. But generally, it's very hard to convince um, people to spend enormous amounts of money on an experiment like this purely on the basis of discovery space. You have to say something more precise about what you might discover under some restrictive scenario. Um, and I think that's a bit sad, but it's the way it seems to be. The other one is that... I'm not sure I agree with that. 
can, shall I I'll give you, I, I, you? It seems to be the case for the rest of astrophysics, but for some reason, when we're talking about exoplanets, people want us to be more specific. They want to know. They want to know how many planets we'll find life on. When I do public outreach in Switzerland, and this may be peculiar to Switzerland, but we had a uh, for the uh, 200th anniversary of Darwin in, in 2009, we had a big exhibition on evolution in the uh, main train station, and one of them was on the old Darwin mission, you may remember, from the European Space Agency, and there was a complementary effort in the US called the Terrestrial Planet Finder. We had a booth at the, at the train station, and so many people came up to me and said, but what if we have, instead of carbon-based life, uh, silicon-based life is an important feature of life in the galaxy. And other people were asking, well, how do you define life, and how would you know it if you saw it? And one of the most common refrains I heard is, don't oversell. Don't try to trick me into publicly supporting a facility and telling me that it will do more than it can ever possibly do scientifically. And I, you know, again, <laughs> maybe it was a biased uh, subset of the community, but I always think there's a danger of slipping into this place this where you mode. have to sell it in the 25 word soundbite when, as we all know, and it's part of, you know, publicly communicating what we do as scientists, how more rich and more complex the actual activity is and the complexity of the answers we actually get. I completely agree with you. I think um, the, the one exercise that we did as part of um, the study, where actually we were really relying on the work of a, um, a scientist called Chris Stark, who's done some wonderful simulations of the number of planets that a telescope like this might be able to directly image, depending on the parameters of the telescope and the parameters of the planets of interest, was it, it was essentially a sensitivity study. If you change the parameters of the telescope or the range of planets that you're looking for and their incidence, how do the results change? And that is an interesting exercise regardless, because it enables you to see how sensitive you are to your initial assumptions. Um, but the other important um, goal we had was to identify critical technologies that need to be developed in between now and the moment when such a telescope can actually start being built. Um, and in order to figure out at what level we need to develop those technologies, whether it is the relative uh, positioning of the mirror segment of the telescope or uh, the performance of the coronagraph that such a telescope might have. All of these things, um, it makes a big difference whether you say, I need a contrast of 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus 9. Um, and you need to give some kind of steer on what kind of contrast you wish to achieve. You need to give some kind of steer on how many stars you actually want to be able to study with such a telescope because it's going to directly affect how large you need your telescope to be. So I completely agree with the arguments that you're putting forward, but at the same time, there's always this tension, I think, when we're trying to do very long-term planning for facilities in astrophysics between, um, well, typically the way it's done is you identify a few science cases that are only meant as examples, but they are used to define your scientific requirements. And I admit there are many flaws in this approach, but I haven't yet thought of a obviously better approach. I think it's, it's a balance, because if you, if you came up with the answer that it was zero, mm. uh, or you couldn't do it, you would re-scope, right? I mean, you, you, could, you could set your scientific requirements very high, you find out that the constraints are overwhelming and you can't meet them, and then you would cycle through this validation loop and refine your requirements until you got something that sort of made sense. And to me, the make sense part is sort of the gut check. You like. I kind of know what the answer is, you know. If, if you said the Hubble Space Telescope is, is uh, you know, a two meter class, JWST is 6.5, you know, would it make sense to make a 6.8 meter mirror? I think not. So it has to be significantly bigger by some factor. And then you can find the right science case, if you will, uh, that will help you refine the details in a sense. But overall, you get a good sense that this is the right kind of next generation capability that we're looking for. Absolutely correct. Um, interestingly, when we started the study, we, one of the things we wanted to find out was whether there was some kind of obvious sweet spot. As you dial up the size of your telescope, do you reach a point where it really makes sense to stop there and not go further? And to be honest, we did not find such a sweet spot. If you look at, for example, the number of planets you'll be able to study 
as a function of mirror aperture, it goes up as the diameter to the power of 1.8, so almost as the diameter squared. Um, and it's, it's actually a complex set of processes that give you this number, but it's what the simulations yeah, there's show. There's no threshold that the, um, required yeah. you to argue it must be 11.2 meter diameter or something like this. Yeah, I mean, there is, a, there is a lower threshold, so essentially there would be no point in building something less than 8 meters given the facilities that come beforehand. Yeah. Uh, but you will do considerably better with 12 than 8 meters, and you would do considerably better with 16 than 12, but um, you also have to consider cost and uh, the ability to actually launch such a thing into space. Indeed.